Does it, does it read like I wanted to get a lot of things off my chest and just couldn't stop? I want to make sure that the continuity continues. Governor Eric Holcomb offering advice for the next person to take over as Indiana governor. Inside Indiana host Gary Dick and IBJ editor Leslie Widebenner with an exclusive interview with the governor. Plus, IU President Pam Witten weighs in on what's next for the new IU Indianapolis. We are IU Indianapolis and we're, we're very, very clear about it. We are going to be the best urban public research university in the country. And we head to Rush County where Grandma's chocolate recipe is hitting a sweet spot in a big way. Inside Indiana Business is next. From Indiana's business news leader, this is IBJ Media's Inside Indiana Business with Gary Dick. Presented by Elevate Ventures and Indiana University. Hello and welcome to Inside Indiana Business. I'm Gary Dick. We begin this week with Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb. The governor this week penning a lengthy opinion piece, an open letter of sorts to Hoosier voters and more specifically the candidates looking to succeed him as the state's next chief executive. The piece is published in this week's IBJ and it includes a list of accomplishments, opportunities and challenges facing Indiana. IBJ editor Leslie Weidenbenner and I sat down with the governor in his office for an extended interview and his perspective on what's next for Indiana. Governor, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is an extensive uh, opinion piece uh, you put together, uh, talking about accomplishments, but also forward looking at uh, what challenges uh, the next governor may face. Why did you write this? Does it, does it read like I wanted to get a lot of things off my chest and just couldn't stop? Uh, no, I, uh, for a couple reasons, uh, I, I think. And first and chiefly, um, I want to make sure that the continuity continues. I tried to put some things to be constructive and helpful to whoever follows to look at this as almost a template. Like these are the things that are going to come across your desk and you'll have to deal with them whether you want to or not. They're obviously doing a lot of advertising. There have been some debates. There will be more debates. Do you feel like they're not, those candidates aren't talking about the things that matter the most to voters? Well, what I hear people that approach me is they say, we know what they're against. We know they're against masks. We know they're against illegal immigrants. We know they're against uh, China. What are you for? And then tell me how you're going to do it. And uh, we've made a lot of progress over the years and we've got a ways to go. And I tried to be very honest about this in the op-ed that, you know, we got work to do. If you think about the successes yeah. that Indiana has had in microelectronics and electric vehicles, hydrogen, new energy, those areas, how concerned are you about that new workforce that will need to be created, that talent pipeline? How big an issue is that for the next governor? It's happening right now and it's really scaling up. And so I am concerned that, that we continue to prioritize workforce development that's going to, that's going to address where we need to be in 10 years from now. I, I used to worry about um, just, just the workforce and the sheer numbers. Now I also worry about, and I alluded to this earlier, but having the power to, to fuel those enterprises. Because if you don't have that fuel or that power addition, that energy, um, then there's no place for those folks to go to work. Now we're going to end our first quarter here soon, obviously, and, and we'll, I think, break another all-time record for the first quarter. It only looks like it's going to grow for the, the next few quarters after that. Talk about the microelectronics uh, hub and the hydrogen hub. These are, these are areas where Indiana won't look the same 10 years from now. Would you anticipate that, that the model of the Leap Innovation District in Boone mm. County, yeah. uh, the state acquiring land, getting future uh, forward-leaning industries, if you will, Lilly with a major investment obviously yeah. there, that that, that model that, that uh, would be used going forward would be beneficial for the state to continue to replicate the Leap model? Has to. There's just no question. If you're not ready for investment, not attention, but investment, you're flown over. And we're done with the days of being flyover country here. They don't have to all be the leap size, but that's competing against Georgia and Florida. And if we weren't ready with a, a site ready to go, we wouldn't be in the conversations we're in right now. 
And these opportunities will change lives and family prospects for the better for generations to come. LEAP is interesting because it does have its detractors. Sure. And, uh, and some controversies. Do you worry at all that the person who comes after you might decide to go another direction and not either not continue with LEAP or, or may not use that method in other areas? Completely um, fair question and one I've thought a lot about. I think we're um, moving down the road. We'll have to prove it. And I've always said in terms of water for, I mean, the elephant in the room here is, is, is there enough water for, for not just central, north central Indiana, but for that project as well. And we'll prove that there is. We'll let the facts speak for themselves. And you think that evidence could Absolutely. be there by the, before the next governor takes office. Yeah. You think that evidence is going to be there? I think much of it will. And you'll be able to say exhibit A was before and exhibit B is after. Which do you prefer? Do you want to be on the side of growth and opportunity or the status quo? Much more ahead with Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb. Infrastructure, big road and bridge projects. The state has gotten high marks for infrastructure. What's next? I-69 is a date set for opening. We'll talk about that and regional economic development when we return. Welcome back to the office of Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb. I'm joined by IBJ editor Leslie Weidenbenner. As we continue our discussion, and uh, Governor, certainly infrastructure has been a big focus of the state uh, for some time now. Everybody sees the big projects around the state. I-69 uh, has long uh, been uh, wondered about, talked about, debated about. <laughs> Do we have a date uh, for the I-69 opening? We will, and it will be before I walk out that door for the last time. It'll be later this year, and INDOT will keep us all informed, but think fall time. You and your predecessors have used creative ways to fund some of these projects, including the toll road lease, the, renegotiate, or the, the renegotiation of it. Um, what does the next governor face in terms of trying to fund infrastructure? This is exactly what I want to hear more about is with a finite amount of revenue and a lot of different priorities and policies going into January, this is what you're going to have to be dealing with and thinking about right now. And, um, you know, I can remember you've, you've just reminded me going back to 2003, 2004, my how time flies. But that governor, ultimately Mitch Daniels, decided we were going to commit ourselves to building that first section. And it, it made it almost inevitable, or pressure was on, for the next folks to, to complete the task and the job. And here we are already, um, and we'll be able to say we did it. But it was because of creativity and courage. I know you don't want to play favorites, but um, as you look into that next hotspot, you look in Fort Wayne with the downtown development there, with the big data center going in there, Jeffersonville and in Southeast Indiana, another big data center in that region. And increasingly, we cover stories in Northwest Indiana, uh, the double tracking expansion of the South Shore, uh, the Quantum Corridor, they've got a lot going on, a population increasing for the first time in more than a decade. Where, where are we gonna see that next maybe growth pocket outside of, uh, outside of central Indiana? You mentioned southeast Indiana going up to northwest Indiana. If you just think about that, that, that distance, I-65, going from River Ridge and the explosive growth there, Cummins Corridor, central Indiana, and all the biotech that's gonna explode here, up through Lebanon, up through West Lafayette, all the way up into what you arrive at, you're a neighbor to the third biggest economy in the country. LA, New York, Chicago, the region. It's incumbent upon us to make the investments, infrastructure and the like, whether it's at Burns Harbor, our port that gets you out to ocean access, uh, or commuter rail, like double track in the South Shore Line. So all of a sudden, what used to be double tracked up into Naperville and Wheaton is going across to Michigan City. First time in over a century that we've double tracked this thing. 
And so um, the Westlake Corridor expansion, I could go on and on and on, but um, the investments that we're making in partnership with their vision um, in Northwest Indiana is flat out exciting. And it's just, in my opinion, in the last five, 10 years, they, they turned a corner and they're moving full steam ahead. It's not just the train, it's the whole region and that economy. And truly the best is yet to come. I'm really, really bullish and excited about Northwest Indiana. Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb on the future of Indiana. A, a little more now on I-69, the year 2012, when then Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels piloted his Harley to Southwest Indiana to mark the opening of the very first completed section of I-69 in Southwest Indiana. It's been a project decades in the making and totaling some $4 billion. Now about to cross the finish line. And if you'd like to uh, check out our entire 30 minute interview with Governor Holcomb, we've got it for you at InsideIndianaBusiness.com and you can check out the governor's op-ed at IBJ.com. Well, I was fortunate this week to MC a forum uh, featuring all eight candidates for Indiana governor in Fishers. It was put on by the Indiana chapter of the National Federation of Independent Business, Indiana Builders Association and Americans for Prosperity. Uh, education, workforce, taxes, economic development, all part of that discussion. Also coming up, uh, our partners at Fox 59 CBS 4 hosting a live debate with the top GOP candidates this Tuesday, March 26. Well, up next, a deep dive into the transformation taking place at IUPUI. Purdue and IU splitting into separate campuses. IU President Pam Witten on what's next for students, research, and business development in Indianapolis. Time now for our Eye on Education, brought to you by Burn. PNC Bank. This belief that if you continually learn, push, and grow, you can not only make a living, but make a difference. Putting what you love and what you learn into practice, and now at IU Indianapolis, further has never been closer. Well, the dawn of a new era in higher education in Indiana, after more than 50 years, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, uh, parting ways. A lot of moving parts since IU and Purdue announced, made a big announcement last year. They would create separate independent campuses in Indianapolis starting this fall. What does the split mean for the city, business community, the state, and for students? Well, I sat down with IU President Pam Witten this week to get her vision for the new IU Indianapolis. We are, we're very, very clear about it. We are going to be the best urban public research university in the country, bar mm -hmm. none. Uh, and we're on our way. Indiana University President Pam Witten leading the transformation from the former IUPUI <laughs> to the new IU Indianapolis with a clear emphasis on research and innovation. You know, the first step will be uh, to firmly be established as, as an R1 institution, and that simply means that you're a university uh, that performs at the highest level of research. And um, the city of Indianapolis deserves an R1, a freestanding, fully accredited R1 university. The new IU Indianapolis also putting a premium on STEM education and innovation, building a new tech corridor, which adds up to a more than $250 million investment in health and life sciences. With that comes the creation of two inst institutes. One is the Institute of Human Health and Wellbeing, and the other one is uh, for Emergent Biotech Solutions. Witten also placing a priority on using IU Indianapolis to increase partnerships and collaborations with Hoosier businesses. With this will come um, startup companies, will come entrepreneurial activities for our students, will become partnerships with the industry that's here, and really an opportunity for us to lean into recruiting new industry to, to the city of Indianapolis as well. A plan that has business leaders like IBJ Media CEO Nate Feltman on the bullish side of what's next. We're looking at ideas for stronger economic development impact, looking at ideas for creating out of the research that will take place at the new Indianapolis, new companies, new ideas for collaboration with industry. Whether you're studying business, data science, or biochemistry, 
The professors and researchers here are real-world professionals in helping students get jobs right here in Indy and around the world. And what we're going to see is all the things, both implicit and explicit, that happen when you have a research one university in a city. And you put on top of that the fact that we are going to be the best urban public research university in the country, and um, we'll feel it. We'll all have a bounce in our step from it. Well, IU Indianapolis, not the only topic uh, we spoke about with President Witten. Um, more on IU's 2030 plan on an upcoming episode of the Business and Beyond podcast. Look for that. Well, coming up next, something to tickle your sweet tooth. Could Rushville become a heavy hitter in the world of artisan chocolates? Up next, meet the man putting the small Indiana city on the map using his grandma's recipe as inspiration. Here's what's making news around Indiana. Brought to you by the Indiana Association of Realtors. Indiana's 21,000 Realtors. The neighbors you know, the experts you can count on. Well, have you ever heard of a DORA? It stands for Designated Outdoor Refreshment Area, and it's catching on in Indiana. Inside Indiana Biz Business reporter Mary Rachel Redman with more. Here's the concept of Dora. It's a relatively new Indiana law that allows people to go into an establishment, order a drink, and take it outside to enjoy it within a specified area. And cities like Fort Wayne are starting to cash in on Dora, using it as a magnet to draw people to the city's downtown riverfront district, which hosts up to 45 events every year. Draw people downtown, um, but really start to encourage them to obviously go into an establishment, dine, um, grab a carryout cocktail, whatever that might look like, and then hopefully continue to enjoy our events and then go from one business location to the next. Uh, we think that we're really going to be supporting our business owners quite a bit. And we're going to be bringing a lot of value to them. Fort Wayne leaders working through public safety measures before setting an official start date for Dora. Northern Indiana getting a big boost to live up to reputation as the orthopedic capital of the world. Plug and Play, a global Silicon Valley based company opening new operations on Zimmer Biomet's campus in Warsaw to focus on med tech development in the region. Plug and Play's platform connects healthcare innovation with startups, corporations, venture capital firms, universities and governments. And this last story, well, it's a bit of a hidden gem, especially if you get the occasional hankering for something extra sweet. Guilty. My sweet tooth led me to a rather unconventional confectionery hotspot in none other than Rushville, Indiana. If you blink, you might just miss it, but that's nothing new for Dustin Cornett. I think we're used to the whole hidden gem thing because our previous location was in Appalachia in literally the middle of nowhere around the Red River Gorge and you had to kind of just navigate and find us. So I think we do hidden gem well. That they do. Tucked inside a nondescript strip mall, you'll find Chocolate Cafe. And along with it, a line of people that snakes around the corner, each one hoping they'll be lucky enough to score whatever sweet treat is on that day's menu before they sell out. If you open at 8 and everything's gone by 8.30, I'd say that's, that's pretty fast. The word of mouth um, and then on social media has been great. Uh, that's been the best way to reach everybody. I haven't really wanted to promote because I haven't been able to keep up with everything. Chocolate Cafe is a family affair. <laughs> Dustin makes the chocolate and the coffee, and his wife, Mai, well, she's the one making the mouth-watering menu of desserts. Sweets, cheesecake, other pastries, Danish, cream horns, croissants, and then we have the gourmet chocolates, uh, the chocolate bars. But Dustin Cornett didn't set out to be a chocolatier. In fact, it was a family recipe, his grandmother's to be exact, that initially sparked his interest. Just so happened to run across my grandma's candy recipes. And my grandma is kind of a legend back in the day for making these box chocolates in, in Connorsville. So I was very curious about them. And so my wife and I, we kind of played around and we ma made these confections and they were just amazing. And I didn't want to see those recipes go away. So I wanted to use her recipes. And grandma used Hershey's chocolate, which back in the day was, was okay, but uh, now um, I wanted to do better. 
So I decided to create my own chocolate to coat my grandma's recipes. And that's how I became a bean to bar chocolate maker. And while Chocolat Cafe has seemingly been an instant success, perhaps what gets lost in the shuffle is Dustin's truly rare skill set when it comes to actually making the chocolate itself. So I'm a bean to bar chocolate maker and it's kind of a rare thing. I believe there's only a handful of us in the whole state of Indiana. You take the agricultural product of the cacao and you roast it and you grind it and you grind it for about three days. And then at the end of the process, you have chocolate and then you have to temper the chocolate into molds into a bar. It takes about a week to do that. And thanks to Cornette's efforts for the first time ever, downtown Rushville will host a chocolate festival come late November the Midwest Craft Chocolate Festival. So we'll have other craft chocolate makers from around the region, around the nation, around the globe, come to Rushville, um, sell their products. We'll do a bunch of educational um, programs to tastings where we can teach what we're doing, why it's important, and uh, educate the general public about why you should buy craft chocolate and not Hershey's. Mary Rachel, the amazing thing is they've only been open for about a month. Just a month wow. and word of mouth, social media. He's got people coming from hours yeah. away all throughout Indiana. And I must say the chocolate is delicious. Look forward to that uh, chocolate festival in November. Great, thanks. Great report, great news for Rush County too, thanks. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Inside Indiana Business. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm Gary Dick. We leave you this week with some of the sights and sounds around Indiana as we transition from winter to spring. Go out and make it a successful week.